So welcome everybody to the October 901 Advisory Task Force Lunch and Learn. Today I'm very pleased to present to you uh, Hamilton NG901, who is going to be talking to us about cybersecurity and public safety. Um, that includes Abby Magato, Ryan Weintier. Did I pronounce that right, Ryan? You did. Yeah. Uh, and Rob Leonard. Um, they have told me that they prefer to get questions during the presentation instead of holding them to the end. So I'm going to be watching for hands raised. And so if anybody has a question, just use the little hand raise feature at the bottom center of your screen, and I will uh, try to keep track of those and let uh, let the presenters know that they have a question from the audience. And with that, I will turn it over to you guys to introduce yourselves and uh, provide us your presentation. Yeah, thanks, Daryl. Uh, and thanks to everybody who made it today. I really look forward to a good conversation centering around cybersecurity and public safety. Um, and as Daryl said, a conversation is always better than a lecture. So we want to invite you guys to uh, interrupt us, raise your hand. Um, those ideas that you know come to mind in the in the moment are always better than oh I'll ask that later and 20 minutes later you don't remember what you were what you were thinking so we're here to be as much of a help as possible we have approximately 45 minutes of content as we as we've run through this a couple times so we have plenty of time for questions and hopefully if you ask good questions we'll cover some of the slides um, and be prepared for it so as we move on. Uh, like Daryl said, my name is Ryan Wind here. I manage uh, Hamilton's NG911 division, and I have with us today uh, Robert Le Robert Leonard. Uh, we'll probably refer to him as Rob. Uh, he's our information security manager. Wears a few IT hats here at Hamilton, uh, but worked closely with Rob for a number of years. Um, I've been with Hamilton for about 10 years. I, you know, if you gave me one one word title, I'd work in sales, but I manage our NG911 division, manage some of our key accounts, manage some of our state accounts, and take care of really a lot of custom technology solutions that Hamilton provides to our customers. And Rob, why don't you introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks, Ryan. Um, I'm Rob Leonard. I'm the information security manager for um, Hamilton NG911 and Hamilton as a whole. Um, I've been in IT cybersecurity for uh, 20 plus years, going on I think the 22nd year. So um, like Ryan said, I do wear a lot of hats or have worn a lot of hats. I was the LAN admin and network management uh, manager uh, for quite some time. Um, and of course, that include backup recovery, implementation of, um, of a lot of the security controls based on you know, prior knowledge of running the, the network. Uh, CompTIA Security Plus certified, um, you know, security audits and program management of multi-platform uh, networks. Um, we, we do span multiple, multiple states. Uh, we, we do a lot of things as uh, we'll allude to during the presentation. Um, I was a uh, former Cavalry Scout in the U.S. Army for uh, the state of Nebraska's National Guard. Um, a couple stateside deployments and um, deployment to Afghanistan in 2010 and 2011. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of my background. Yeah. Thanks, Rob. Mm -hmm. uh, probably just take two minutes here, three minutes maybe, talk, talk about Hamilton a little bit. Uh, we've been around since 1901. Our roots are as a telephone company, kind of the beginning of technology, right? You go back to just having a telephone. Um, we've evolved since then. We um, have multiple divisions of our company working in fiber, internet, uh, telecommunic telecommunications relay services for the deaf and hard of hearing. Um, we have, you know, contracted telecommunication services. Um, on a local, state, and national basis. I won't read all the rest of that to you. A quick scan of our kind of our corporate map. We Our headquarters is in Aurora, Nebraska, so that's where we were founded as a telephone company. But now we have uh, blue represents states where we have contracted telecommunication services in. Uh, the, white, the white dots um, are offices. The white starbursts are kind of fiber stars that represent where we have offices across the country. And then we have staff uh, across the country as well. So our objectives today, right? We have four main objectives that we hope to, hope to cover. Kind of some starting points and opportunities facing the public safety sector. 
trying to bust some of the myths around cybersecurity and then some of the biggest operational threats and security challenges that the public safety sector faces. And then what, what the next steps are for PSAPs and ECCs. And the next one, we always like to start with uh, with this cartoon. And I always joke because Rob's both the big buff guy carrying the gun and he's also the guy sitting behind the computer protecting the network, right? So what will the warrior, warrior guardian of the future look like? Well, it's, it's both, but the cyber part is just as important today as, you know, as our traditional um, way of, of guarding our country. So I, I've never seen Rob wear a backwards hat though. So maybe it's not quite accurate. <laughs> um, so we'll jump, we'll jump right into myth number one. Um, Peace apps are completely secure from cyber threats. Yeah, that's, uh, that, that's definitely not, not the case you know uh, no matter the size and the scope your operation likely carries vulnerabilities and to put that into a little bit of perspective you know a lot of the times we hear um you know i'm, I'm part of the legacy network you know uh, i'm removed from the internet um you know these different things that give you a, a good warm feeling but really just kind of aren't true um you know you still have the human factor you have um you have the ability if you have email you know you're obviously connected to the internet in some form or fashion so um we'll get into some of the the actual uh, threats later later in the uh, presentation but it's very it's very very important to uh first and foremost realize what your vulnerabilities are right not to assume that that things are a certain way because you believe they are um, and again we'll talk about you know, believe versus verify later in the presentation. But this is definitely a myth and we'll expound upon it later. You know, I yeah. think it's just a few slides. So 80% of senior IT and IT security leaders believe that their organizations lack sufficient protection against cyber attacks. So let me say that again, 80% of C senior IT and IT security leaders believe that they have work to do, right? Um, they're correct. Um, you're never done doing security ever. Um, we feel that um, we work very hard to maintain our security posture as a company and help our clients and customers do the same thing. But to ever pretend like you have reached the goal of cybersecurity is one of the biggest risks you can introduce, um, and that's complacency. Um, you look at that $3.86 million average cost of a data breach, um, you start applying that type of, uh, that type of um, really risk realization to, to some of uh, smaller entities, that's devastating, right? Not to mention just the impact that it would have on public safety. But from a monetary standpoint, it, it, it's significant. Now, obviously, the 3.86 doesn't compare to one single life, obviously, uh, but it kind of puts a monetary um, a monetary value to what a breach would cost. Um, and then this final one, Google hit a record of 2.1 registered phishing sites. One, 2.1 million phishing sites at, as of January 17th of, of this year up from one point about 1.7 a year ago right so 20 27 percent over the last 12 months um ransomware phishing sites all, all of the things that we're hearing about on a daily basis it seems um is only going up and uh, we we foresee that to continue in in the in the future uh, the foreseeable future and that percentage will we believe will be considerably more So you talk about who are targets, right? Government agencies and small business are our targets. Um, we, we, we talk about the challenges of that, right? Um, there's going to be a lot of people that want uh, street cred, if you will, on Reddit and some of these other social media sites. Uh, we'll talk about that. Um, lack of standards, right? It's hard to meet a standard if you don't know what the expectation is or what that standard is. And uh, being able to apply that to a state, right? Instead of just a county, 
having one county do something other than what another county is doing is only really injects um, confusion. And when there's confusion to what you're doing, the opportunity for vulnerability to be exploited uh, goes up exponentially. Um, you know, some of the, uh, the challenges you're moving to an IP based offer um, operations, right? And so when you go into an internet protocol, which is what IP based stands for internet protocol based, you introduce certain things to your environment, like phishing, ransomware, data backups become considerably more important. Um, and then the lack of in house security and IT staff, you know, budgets really control everything. And if you don't have the budget available for um, in-house security or IT staff, that could be a that could be a big challenge moving forward. So when we talk about IP based, right, we think about all the things that are good and bad of the internet, right? The good part is that um, communication is instant. Um, rich text across to uh, law enforcement is. Um, is fast, it's reliable, it's um, very informative, which makes their job safer and it makes the ability to respond faster. Uh, but you need antivirus. You need to make sure your stuff's patched. You need to make sure your backups are viable. You need to be testing those backups. Um, and so when you move to an IP-based system, there's a lot of ad additional controls that really have to be um, looked at and implemented if it's uh, if it makes sense to do so and it's fiscally responsible. Real time monitoring, you know, you now have to you have to monitor your networks. You know, it's it, the days of of um, putting certain things in place and then hoping it works are gone. Right, um, we don't have that luxury anymore. And as a security provider, we understand that monitoring has to be in place in order to have more of a proactive look at security as opposed to how it was done back in the day which was reactive right oh my gosh we've been breached let's react to it now with there's certain real-time monitoring you can put in place to know that you're being um exploited and to not only take care of that exploit in a proactive manner, but to actually start gathering evidence so that those individuals can now be prosecuted, which um, is something that we weren't able to do, you know, as early as two to three years ago. And then again, dedicated security staff, what's the fiscally responsible answer? That's usually what it comes down to um, in this situation, including Hamilton. You know, what, what cost are you going to put to remediating what the business impact can be, right? And sometimes partnering with someone may be the answer. Um, you can do that in-house, you can have somebody do it, or you can have a hybrid of the two. And that's kind of what we're talking about today. So you think about case studies, um, 70, you know, 70 plus state and local governments hit, uh, hit with ransomware. It's a big number. You know, especially when it, uh, when you think about government and not just at the state level, not even at the municipality level, but think about the federal level. Think about the different things that have happened that we've heard about the U.S. Treasury. We've heard about, you know, China's gotten into this and North Korea's gotten into that. Um, that is true for two thirds of the ransomware attacks um, last year. Right. It was government. Um and nearly 400 cyber um, attacks in two years against U.S. public safety agencies and local governments. You guys are probably no more. You guys are probably more aware of that and have studied and seen and read about those particular attacks because the, it, it hits close to your home, right? It hits close to your heart. What you love, what you like, what you like to do, keeping your community safe. But people do that because it's big news. Right. It's really big news. And um, unfortunately, you know, public safety takes a hit with that. Um, but we're going to show how to get around that here later in the presentation. Um, I did a presentation in person before COVID in Baltimore, Maryland, and it was it was recently after Maryland, uh, Baltimore had had their uh, ransomware attack and an estimated eighteen point two million dollars uh was lost or delayed revenue um and direct restoration costs a lot of the reason for that is because baltimore didn't know what to do 
Um, they, they knew that they were going to have to bring their systems back up or they were going to have to pay the ransom. And nobody knew what that decision was, right? Because they didn't know what was the impact of each decision. And so being able to have that done proactively and know that, hey, if if a county in Colorado gets hit with ransomware, this is our path, right? And having those things in place. So God forbid you do realize that particular impact, that at least you have a incident response channel to follow to get you back up and running as soon as possible. And and, and Baltimore didn't have that. Uh, Jefferson County, Georgia, um, kind of the same thing, except that their screen simply went dark. Um, you know, they didn't, they didn't, the ransomware attack itself wasn't like Baltimore. This was more of a DDoS attack, right? A denial of service attack where things just simply went down because the phone lines were overwhelmed right if you can take 11 calls and you got 15 coming in that's overburdensome to the system and the system doesn't know what to do so it does nothing right it just stops um but think about that last line sheriff's deputies lost use of laptops and license plate database access my goodness you know you think about how how our um our public safety officers use their laptops and mobile data today to look up, um, you know, all the things about certain people that they either have pulled over, warrants, uh, missing persons, all these different things, right? And if they would have had some type of plan in place, they would have been able to maybe thwart that attack. But if they couldn't thwart it, at least have a path to get back up as soon as possible. Excellent, excellent intro here rob i don't know is there any questions so far about where we've started all right we'll move on to uh the next myth then hackers are the biggest threat to your operation what's the answer rob oh i wish that was the case <laughs> um, you know unfortunately it's our people it's always us right it's always the person clicking on the phishing email it's the person plugging their phone into the usb port because they think it's okay to charge it it's um you know it's all those things that we're very very aware of um people by nature um, make decisions um based on certain situations in a point of time right and if that person's stressed or if that person is other than focused on cybersecurity, they're going to make decisions that maybe aren't in the best interest of cybersecurity, right? So the best thing that you can do is train your people. The, the great thing about that is that it's, it's one of the cheapest things that you can implement that has the biggest impact on cybersecurity. Um, just having our people, you know, we, we train our people, um, you know, once a year, full blown cybersecurity training. But then four times a year, we also send them a phishing email. You know, we, we, we want to know who's clicking, not because they're bad people. If, we, if they were bad people, they wouldn't be on staff. What we're doing is that we're bolstering our posture, right? We're training our people to understand that they are part of the security team, first and foremost, but that what they do every day has a, a very big impact on on our ability to do business or your ability to route 911 calls or your ability to send that rich text information to the people that need it the most during during a crisis. So, um, you know, training your people is simple as sending a, a list of emails to a provider that can kick out a phishing email um, to test and see where you're at. Um, you know, you might need a little bit more, more training than say, you know, PSAP B um but you might not it's, it's it uh, until you get that baseline you really don't know where you're at and training your people and having them fished and getting them the cybersecurity annual training that they need will really help you gauge that while bringing down your actual risk and as i move to the next slide i always like to emphasize what rob said there it happens to the best of us i 
you know, I live and breathe this stuff right alongside Rob. I don't think I've failed a fishing test in, well, I don't know, the whole time I've worked here until this year I received, you know, the phishing email that was just the perfect masterpiece where the domain was spoofed perfectly. The signature matched exactly to the recipient that I was familiar with. Everything was made to look exactly like the person that I had worked with previously. And I clicked it, you know, so then I had to, had to do the walk of shame and call it, call Rob, say, guys, I don't, I mean, I, we have a preset of plans here at Hamilton. I know exactly what to do on the, on the back here by my board is this is what you do. So I followed the steps exactly, unplugged my computer from the network, called it. They came, they ran the extra scan, made sure, you know, luckily no major impact, but I mean, these things are getting more sophisticated all the time. And here, someone that kind of lives and breathes this still happens. It still happens. Mm-hmm. So I'll let Rob go. Rob, we got a question in the chat from Jerry Delval. Okay. It says, do you use a phishing framework like GoFish or do you use a proprietary software? Yeah, so we use a third-party software that allows us to um, kick out certain levels of phishing um, attack simulations. Um, and we can kick those out to, um, you know, anybody with an email address. Um, and then the great part about that is that those people get instant training. So when Ryan clicks on in, you know, if Ryan were to click on it on another email, phishing email, it automatically routes them to, oops, you, you, you got fished. Here's, here's what the email looks like. And here are the certain things that you should have noticed, right? Um, Maybe a name spelled wrong. Like Ryan said, maybe the signature looks a little bit off, but it looks close enough, you know? Um, And you can just increase the level of sophistication when it comes to those phishing emails. So not only are you showing your employees what, what it is they did wrong, but you can also increase like I said, the sophistication so that you're not just doing the same thing over and over again. You're actually building on your security posture. So yeah, we use um, we use third-party software that does that and we find it to be very efficient. Yeah, some, you know, something is better than nothing. Uh, the one thing that I think what Rob's saying there, you know, he tailors it to, you know, our internal audience when we're fishing our, and we tailor it to our customers. So, you know, the more you can make it look like specific to a 911 dispatcher's life, the more likely you are to, you know, I don't, you, you're not searching for the gotcha, but you are trying to train them because if you send them something about, hey, you know, your factory inventory is low, no one falls for that. I mean, it's not specific to a 911 dispatcher's industry. They're not going to fall for that fish. So, you know, Rob makes some specific, Rob and our IT team here, they make them specific to telecommunications to the day-to-day operations of Hamilton. That's what we get. Um, We make them specific to our customers as well. And if you have that ability, it usually makes it just one step better. And and you look at this graph, or excuse me, this this slide here, and you look at that middle bottom one, incidents involve phishing, 93%. Right. So 93 percent of incidents involved fishing in some form or fashion. So it just kind of kind of builds on if you can if you can spend, you know, two thousand dollars a year to help remediate 93 percent of what caused incidences. Boy, that's that's a big chunk of the cybersecurity threat that you're knocking out. Plus, what it also does is it brings everybody into the security team, right? And it's important that when you do these phishings, that you talk to these people, right? Not just that something comes up and says, hey, you clicked on the wrong thing. And people want to do a good job. You know, people, especially especially in this particular sector, because lives are at stake, right? So the more you can fold people in and say, hey, we noticed you clicked on this. Here's what it looks like. Here's, you know, you're not in trouble first and foremost. You know, this is something that should be sent to everybody uh, from the high, from the highest position to the lowest. So that when somebody says, am I in trouble? You say, well, no, this gets sent to everybody, right? 
And so it, it folds them into the team and actually makes them part of the security team. So when you, when you move away from the human factor, right? You, you, you start thinking about different network threats, not really how they're introduced, right? A lot of the times they're introduced by um, one of two ways, our people or other people, right? And so we think about viruses, you know, viruses have, have um, really taken a backseat to other threats um, today because people don't get anything out of them, right? That the APT or the active persistent threat isn't getting paid to launch a virus or a zero day attack on your network, right? So we've seen we've seen a, a vast decline in, in virus propagation because there's no money in it, right? So where is the money? Well, it's in ransomware, right? That's all we ever hear about nowadays. We don't hear about viruses. We hear about ransomware. We hear about um, the phishing emails. Um, again, our end users and the threat that they pose if they're if they're not properly trained. Um, but we have seen some traditional instances where TDOS or a telephony denial of service and a DDoS or distributed denial of service attack um, still happen. Now, in the traditional sense, they only happen because people want to brag about it. Oh, I brought down the security cameras on Donald Trump's inauguration day, right? That was one. A 16-year-old kid from Georgia brought down all of the surveillance cameras on, uh, on the mall um, about a half an hour before the inauguration ceremony, which obviously threw Secret Service into um, a tizzy trying to, one, get, get their ability to survey the area up and running again, but was it the beginning of a bigger attack, right? And so, um, but what we're seeing is a shift. We're seeing a shift from the kids that are um, attempting to post on Reddit that they did this or that to more monetary compensated attacks, right? And that again is ransomware. Let's, so let's talk a little bit about traditional versus today. Traditional was you had a you had a denial of service attack and it brought down the network. And everybody tried to figure out where to come from, how to get in there, patch the firewall, get us back up, and off you go. Now, the time frame for doing that obviously uh, varies based on the size of, of the business and the attack. But now what we're seeing is we're seeing a shift from traditional to ransomware-based TDOS and DDoS attacks. And what does that mean? So instead of just bringing down your network, what they're doing is they're attempting to bring it down to such a crawl that it's still up. It's just almost unbearable to do anything. And so people say, okay, we're DDoSing you or we're TDoSing you. And in order to make this stop, we want a million dollars, right? So they're implementing a newfound ransomware way of, of attacking and implementing it into an old way of disrupting service and they're getting paid for it right and so you're seeing this morph from kids that were just kind of goofing around and trying to get free internet and stealing this and stealing that to actually people being motivated by money and what a motivator right love and money right there's no two bigger motivators and when you introduce that money into these attacks, the attack vector goes up. The risk landscape yep. goes up. So it's very, very, uh, it's very interesting to see that shift. Um, we talked about employee training. I can't, I, you know, I can't hit on employee training enough. Not because I believe in it, but because I've seen it work. Right? I've seen it in in our own business. We've got fourteen hundred employees. Right. We kick we do our training like we would do if we were 100 employees. Why? Because it gives stability. Right. If you've got 100 counties or PSAPs doing security training a certain way. And then you've got two that aren't. What, what happens? Right. There's this disconnect. There's this um, there's this lack of cohesion when it comes to standardizing 
something, whether that's training or how you build your servers or, you know, any myriad of different things. Um, you know, we talked about how it involves people in the security effort. If they feel involved, they're going to want to do more. Um, it brings to the forefront that, hey, security is an issue and we have to be we have to be a cognizant of that. Um, and so it starts to build that culture. Um, and maybe most important, it helps to reduce costs by proactively eliminating threats, which is now, which is great, which is now a real option. You don't have to, you don't have to wait to get hit in the face anymore, right? You and can, the, you can and see it coming. Yeah. And the culture thing, you can't overstate it because having the training, having the open dialogue, it's, it's like opening the floodgates, you know, with your teenager or whatever. It's like, you can't, you can't have the topic be out of bounds. It needs to be a part of the, a part of the day-to-day -day life of your people and have them be okay with, they don't have to be the expert, but if they have a question, they should ask it because, or if they see something that's fishy or weird, they should ask, it shouldn't be ashamed to ask those questions. Um, they shouldn't be ashamed to, you know, make someone show their badge to enter the building or things like that, where it's, this is a part of who we are and it just has to be a part of how we do um, our operations on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, that's, that's well put. It's how we have to do, it's how I have to do it day to day, yep. day in, day out, week in, week out. And then share that information with, with your fellow counties, you know, yep. or your, or whatever, um, whatever level, whether it's at the town level, city level, county level, um, you know, the, the problem is, is that no one state has one single way of training their people. And that's a little bit scary because one, they're either not doing it or it's inefficient. You know, and what we're trying to do and what we're trying to educate on is getting that standardized, whether it's with us, whether it's with somebody else, it really doesn't matter. What matters is that the state itself does everything the same way, right? So that if you go to from one county to another, it, it, it's not different. And um, we all know, too, that 911, the infrastructure is just a network of networks. And you, you hate to go to the old, you know, saying that you're only as good as your weakest link. But, you know, when, you know, a city computer gets hacked and then somehow that the city computer is connected to the PSAP and you see those ransomwares travel. Um, I mean, we just see those instances. And so counties are networked and cities are networked and neighboring county, you know, our regions or things like that. The way 911 is, it's just a network of network that it's very difficult to manage all of that risk until you start to take that training and education, you know, to a bigger level, to a statewide type of level. Yeah. So we'll go, we'll hit the next slide there. Um, Rob, I guess the next myth is cybersecurity is complicated. Um, you know, it, it doesn't have to be, um, you know, you can make it, you can make really anything complicated, you know, and we believe that um, it doesn't have to be we believe that there's a certain standard and that there's a certain step there, you know, there's certain plans there are certain ways of doing things. Um, but even with a tight budget, there are immediate actions that PSAPs can take. You know, we were talking about, you know, phishing your people, um, annual security training that's delivered via email from a third, from a third party, whatever those things are. Um, yeah, but it's very, very important to, to implement, training I, I just can't i can't I, I know i harp on it but um it's just it's the way to go it's the best yeah. way to remediate uh, the the most risk and then you put yourself in a position to start to start springboarding off of that right because you've already got this base in place um and when i look at this lack of funding the best part about fishing and training your people is that you need way less, way less funding to do that than to respond to an incident, right? And we, and you and I have talked about it a lot of times, Rob, where, you know, our experience in the 911 industry, we see a lot of similarities to the military, you know, obviously law enforcement, the military, but it's standard operating procedures, telling people, you know, you live and breathe in the heat of a moment of 911 calls and an emergency and, you know, I just need to know 
the steps. This is what I do. Just like when I followed my list, when I got mm-hmm. fished, right. you know, people can l- go to a sheet. This is the steps I'm going to take. Writing some of those standard operating procedures, that, you know, are, is very easy as, as a, at least a place to start. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, you know that the money's tight, you know, we get that. We, we understand that. Um, but you can partner with somebody to either provide it all. You can, you can work with somebody to get you moving in the right direction or a hybrid of those two things, you know, and we, we've talked a lot about how understanding the need for security is like understanding that you have to get an oil change on your car. Right. Because, excuse me, because you understand that if you don't, there's a, there's a more expensive, um, thing waiting you down the road, whether that's a blown engine, whether whatever it is, but there's also the safety associated with being stranded in your vehicle. What if it's snowing, you know? Um, And so when you understand that there's a certain amount of maintenance that has to be accomplished in order to not realize a bigger bill or more angst down the road, that is one of the biggest things that you can do for cybersecurity. And that's to understand that you have to do something and it's not always expensive. Um, you know, you think about accountability and expectations, you know, I automatically think about my son um, with this, you know, I expect a lot out of my son, uh, but I also make it very, very clear to him what my expectations are. Right. So he can meet them or exceed them. It's very difficult to expect somebody to be successful when you haven't told them well, what your vision of success is. So, you know, you think about spot checks, um, you do audits every now and then, you know, I hate using the word audit. It's more of an assessment. Um, you know, I, 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 I'm not embarrassed one bit to tell you, I have a comprehensive assessment done of my work every three years. And that includes everything cybersecurity wise. Right. But I also have somebody do penetration testing on our networks once a year. Why? Because I, I want to know. I want to know if something's wrong. You know, I'm not, uh, Hamilton has me on staff because they know I work hard. I don't have, I don't have that feeling of, oh my gosh, if this audit comes back or this assessment comes back and we have to remediate 10 things, that's not a direct reflection of my character. That's a direct reflection of things that just need to be fixed. And to know those proactively um, saves you a lot of money down the road. Um, So yeah, do spot checks, make sure your expectations are clear. Um, If you're in a leadership position of what you expect your people to do and uh, and start building your cybersecurity framework around that. Um, You know, some of the security opportunities is, um, you know, hit employee training again, but build a plan, you know, start building a plan and it's easier to do it from scratch. The, the multitude, the vast majority of the peace apps that we talk to don't have a plan. A lot of the, the states don't have a plan. Yeah, you shouldn't be, shouldn't feel like that's daunting. Building from scratch can be, you know, can be the right place to start. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because you are, because you're already building on what you, um, what what you need right anybody that's added on to a house knows it's easier to build a house from scratch than it is to to add on, right? Because you have that existing house or plan that has to be navigated. It has to be revamped. It has to be um, scrutinized to see if it's actually fitting into what you want to do. When you build a plan from scratch, you already know everything you're putting into it is exactly what you want, right? And exactly what you need. Um, But make sure that your voice is heard. Um, Don't let a third party come in from a cybersecurity perspective and tell you what you need. Okay. You should be able to tell your service provider, we want this uptime. We want this. We want that with suggestions from them, of course. But these are things that you can do from the beginning that gives you the opportunity to have that plan exactly the way you want it. And then you can start building your cybersecurity community. I, um, I love cybersecurity. I read about it all the time, but I, I have a ton of people that help me be successful. Right. And whether that's contacts at 
Department of Homeland Security or the Department of Defense or ISACA or, you know, being a, a Central Florida member of ISACA chapters and going to those meetings and talking to these people and learning from them and them learning from me and having conversations. Um, you build your security community and then you don't have to do it all, right? You hear from a person in your community that this worked. This was cheaper than that. This didn't work, right? This is what I did to fold my team in. Um, and then you can just take those things and implement them the way you want to do it for your particular um, PSAP or state. It's, it's kind of like being a teacher. You know, my prior life, I was a teacher before I changed profession. So I always say, you know, I know 911 professionals and teachers are the probably the two industries that don't get paid enough. But going back to my teaching days, like you didn't have to reinvent the world, right? You have some peers. You have some people that have some experience. You build that peer group that have maybe either – They've either gone through it and you can learn from their experience or they're going through it with you at the same time, trying to get their cybersecurity posture set up and their plans. You go through it together. It doesn't feel quite as daunting to be working with a couple of, you know, peers in your industry to work together mm -hmm. to say, hey, this worked for us. This didn't. We found yeah. this partner for this thing. It's been really cost effective and had a lot of impact. Um, doing that together is so much easier. Yep. And that goes right to our next slide. I, I oops, I yeah. went backwards. So, yeah, better, smarter cybersecurity takes a village, you know, and that and that's the truth. Um, you know, I I try and be as proactive as possible, but um, you know, there's times I get alerts from from outside that that really uh, refocus on a on a particular issue that may be happening that maybe I wasn't aware of. So choosing the right partner, uh, partner with a company that's collaborative in nature. You know, um, if they tell you that you don't need training, they're they're trying to sell you something, right? Um, we we don't believe in in getting as much money or out of out of people that we help with cybersecurity. That's not our focus. Our focus is service based, right? As a uh, former military man I, I i'm just service based I, I i like serving my community i like serving my country i love serving hamilton um but hamilton's the same way right hamilton is a service oriented company um even though we're uh, you know we stretch nationally um we're very active in our communities um and that isn't because of any monetary issue it's because that's who we are so find somebody that is collaborative like that, you know, yep. be, able, be able to ask questions of your cybersecurity professionals and not have to worry about getting a bill for it every single time. You know, I have people call me and say, hey, have you heard about this particular software? I say, yeah, it's terrible. Don't use it. Am I going to bill them for that? No. Why, why would I do that? Right now? I'm not saying I do that all the time, but what I am saying is that it's more important for us to help secure the things that are most important in our communities, like 911, than it is to send a bill out every 10 minutes. That's not that's not the goal. The goal is to secure our communities. And and it's very important to find people that that think like that, like you guys do. I you know, I've talked to many PSAP um, employees, whether it's the top of the chain or the bottom of the chain. And it's very evident that all of your guys' hearts are in protecting um, our fellow citizens. Yeah. So I'll try to sum this up here. So next steps for ECCs, right? We, we've talked about this. Um, the biggest thing that we like to emphasize is, you know, getting an assessment, you know, figuring out where you're at allows you to just, you know, make an honest assessment of where you're at and make a plan for next steps. You know, those those security assessments are not daunting. They're not overwhelming. They're not, you know, extremely expensive, but it's you need that snapshot, right? So, and usually almost all of them are going to come back with, if you're not already doing these things, right? Or the training, the phishing, um, folding in your employees, having those trainings, those discussions about cybersecurity, um, having some type of consultant. If you don't have some type of cybersecurity person on staff, have your go-to person that you can ask about, hey, what's the next thing for us? 
Um, and whether, again, whether that, that person or that entity is asked to conduct the work for you or you're going to take it in-house, it's just having someone to bounce that off of, okay, we're thinking about implementing this next. Is that the next step for us, right? That assessment will allow you to do that. And then again, this isn't a secret sauce, right? Share what you learn. There'll be people, you'll be somewhere in the process. There'll be people ahead of you. There'll be people behind you. You can learn from each other along the way. Share what you learn. Promote those discussions in your, your community, so the 911 community, um, and just, you know, help each other out. Anything else there we should add, Rob? Yeah, I, I, it doesn't, you don't, you don't have to give it all to a consultant and pay a whole bunch of money to get it done. You, uh, we suggest working with a consultant so that you're you're very much aware of what the what the goal is and how you can implement it yourself and how you can take that plan and run with it and when you stumble call me you know when you stumble talk to your network when you stumble talk to whoever your uh your your village is right so don't let's don't don't let somebody come in and say in order to be successful you have to pay us a huge amount of money right make sure that they're collaborative and that they're yeah. putting you in a position to be successful without them yeah it's that dependency we don't build the dependency you know one of the greatest things that i think every business and every entity you know where people work they you can find the right person that maybe has a passion for this um, also has a you know an ability for it and let them kind of grow into the role you might not have a cybersecurity expert on staff today. Doesn't mean you don't have someone capable of it. You know, you give them that extra responsibility, something they could take pride in. It's going to make the agency better, right? It's going to give that person, a, you know, probably some extra pride in the work that they do on top of the the great work that they already do there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Another, another question from Jerry. He says, "Would you say your approach to provide services is more purple teaming oriented?" Um, I would say probably not, you know, you, you, you think about blue team, red team, um, and for people that don't understand, uh, aren't familiar with the blue team, red team, you know, blue team and red team is, is they play off each other. One attacks, one defends one, one, you know, puts defenses in place and then tells the other team, okay, try and get past them. Um, so I don't, do I think blue, blue and red teaming is good? Yeah. Do I think it's cost effective for a PSAP? Probably not, right? Because you're you're trying to pay for two ends of the spectrum, the defense and the offense side, right? And when you start building, you know, bringing people in to do that, the cost goes up. Um, and I honestly don't think it's necessary for a whole lot of purple teaming to go on in PSAPs in order to figure out what it is you need to remediate. Yeah, of course, Jerry. Thanks for the question. That's a great question, too, by the way. So, guys, I have a question for you. Uh, as a state employee, and there's a couple other state employees on the on the call today, we go through cybersecurity training quarterly, and it the problem that I see with it is that it's really geared towards the lowest common denominator, yeah. so it's extremely basic. Mm -hmm. And it makes it really hard for me as someone who knows not to click on every link that you get an email from people you don't know. Um, it, it makes it difficult to engage those people who might be a little bit more above, above that very basic level. Do you have any suggestions for how to customize training for uh, employees regarding um, cybersecurity hygiene without you know, bringing it all, all the way down to the, the level of a person who's never used a computer before? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question, Daryl. Um, and, and what we found is that the more often you do a comprehensive training, the more apt people are to ignore it, right? And so if you're hitting somebody with training every month or, you know, it almost gets a uh, um, a little gets overburdensome, you know, that these people are working, you're working. Um, but if it's 
if you have a group of people that are say a little bit more privy to what um, threats are out there, then I would suggest making a list of those individuals so that they can receive more of a more pointed training, more uh, maybe a higher level. And, and we do that, you know, at Hamilton where um, we know that the IT staff is going to be considerably more um, more aware of what threats are out there, right? So our training for our IT staff is considerably different than what it is for just our, you know, the other 100 and, you know, or 1,375 employees, right? So sometimes you have to take a little bit of extra time to tailor certain information and certain trainings for people that um, really need it. Um, and that can be difficult. That can be hard at times. Um, but the great thing about um, the trainings that we do, it gives you a snapshot, um, and but it also gives you trending, right? It can tell you who clicked. Um, and if they've clicked the last two times, but they haven't clicked the third time or the fourth time, you can actually see that the person is improving. So to make a, I guess to make a long answer a little bit longer, is that you're your cybersecurity professional should hear that question. And then my response to you, Daryl, if you were to ask me that question as a cybersecurity training provider, I would say, give me a list of the people that you think might need extra, you know, a more in-depth training. And then provide me with a list of the people that maybe are new hires and they just need new hire training. Um, and so you can have that discussion with your with your service provider so that you can make the training as um, as effective as possible. That kind of goes back to what Ryan was saying about about talking to your security professional and saying, "Hey, you know, when I get training done, it's just it's I'm not getting anything out of it." Okay, great. That's good. It's perfect. Let's let's change that, right? And we do that. Um, we do that all the time. We we have uh, certain. Uh, training for our senior managers. Why? Because they're targeted more simply, right? Um, so that's a great question. And it's a question that you should be able to work through with your service provider to make sure you're getting the most out of your money. Yeah. And it's, it's hard to make a one size fits all for when you, when you yeah. look at like a statewide type of state government, you know, what applies to one agency and the next. I mean, there are some general best practices, but just tailoring it to the audience helps a lot. Um, you know, Hamilton provides a lot of training outreach, um, even in the 911 space for the deaf and hard of hearing community. It's something that's just been a part of our relay services for, you know, for 25 years. I know the state of Colorado, I don't believe is a, is a Hamilton relay contracted state, but we're in the 911 uh, space because educating about how deaf culture works, how our real-time text is going to impact that, trying to be ahead of those things and tailoring it to the audience, right? So, you know, talking to the people that use the service is different than when we talk to the 911 dispatchers that need training on, you know, how the difference between TTY and RTT. Um, and then we do the same in, in kind of the cybersecurity space. It's how does cybersecurity impact 911 is different than how it impacts a factory um it's, it's just different so we tailor those things well and i would you know i would come back daryl and if you were to ask me that question my you know one of the first questions i would ask you is that i bet there's probably four or five other people that that are just like you that you know of that could probably benefit from that training as well so not only did you remediate you not getting the education that you needed you probably remediated the fact that other people weren't getting it either. So by asking those questions and bringing those to the forefront, you, you get your education, but you also increase your security posture by allowing other people to receive that kind of heightened, heightened training as well. Thanks guys, I really appreciate that. Very detailed answer, very good, yeah. very good insight there. Um, we are getting really close to the top of the hour, so I. I think uh, we'll go ahead and call it here. If anybody has any other questions, though, um, I see uh, you do have an email address on the question page.
page there, but if you send them to me, I can also forward them to uh, to our presenters today. So I want to thank uh, Ryan and Rob for presenting to us. Um, and just as a reminder to everybody, uh, you know, based on the EziNet tariff, CenturyLink is responsible for cybersecurity on the EziNet, but cybersecurity in the PSAP is still completely on your individual agencies. Um, so everybody needs to be thinking about these things and thinking about how they can secure their systems and protect their their employees and uh, their citizens um, from uh, malicious attacks from from uh, cyber actors. So with that, I will go ahead and conclude today. And thank you all very much. Uh, a recording, the recording of this presentation will be on the task force's YouTube page within a week. Very good. Thank you so much for having us, Daryl. Yep. Thanks, Daryl.